we are, on this Palm Sunday, going to be looking at what it means to coronate Jesus as our King, as our Lord, in a practical way in our daily lives, that we can experience His power and His freedom. And so, to help us understand what that looks like, I want you to read along with me today in John chapter 12. We're going to look at verses 1 through 15 on this Palm Sunday. I'm reading out of the NIV And as I said, it's on the overhead screens if you want to follow along there. We read that six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. The least they could do is feed him after raising Lazarus from the dead. And Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him, very grateful that he was there breathing and eating. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected to this extravagance. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. And Jesus knew all about it, just like he knows all about our secret intentions. So Jesus says to Judas, leave her alone. It was intended that she would save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. They're losing their influence with the people. Usually when somebody gets raised from the dead, that tends to happen. The next day, the, cr- the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, so they took palm branches, and they went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, which means, rescue us, save us. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey, and he sat down on it. And as it is written, do not be Afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming seated on a donkey's colt. A prophecy fulfilled from Zechariah. Do not be afraid. Your king is coming. I hope you know you don't have to be afraid today. The king is here and he wants to be king of your life. And he wants to partner with you and he wants to help you in whatever you're going through. It's not based on your merit, but on his goodness. You know, in this story, we can identify some very common, ordinary behavior that we can all relate to. First, the idea of a political rally that draws large crowds. We see these regularly. People cheering on a political leader we think can provide for us and protect us and keep our way of life and our security and our comfort. And instead of palms, we hold up signs and bullhorns and we are screaming and cheering on for someone to function as a savior, to rescue us, to deliver us. We can relate in this story to political opponents then that are jealous of the most popular candidate who would love nothing more than to see him drop out of the race or even put to death along with any evidence of his worthiness such as Lazarus here in this story. It's safe to say we can relate even to Judas's discomfort with such an extravagant display of dedication to Jesus. To see someone pour out a year's worth of wages on Jesus brings a pragmatic side out of all of us to say, hey, have you really thought this through? Are you sure you want to do that? Let's not get too extreme with Jesus. I mean, you got to live. A year's worth of wages? Really? 
I think we would agree it's very common, very ordinary to want to protect against any threat, not only to our wealth, but our ease, our comfort. In fact, dare I say, we can relate more than we'd maybe like to admit to the religious leaders in this story and the chief priests who were in collaboration with the Roman government to ensure their own wealth, ease, and comfort. They need to put Jesus away because he's starting to look and feel like a revolutionary against the Roman government. And you see, the Roman government was fine with their rule and their political stature and status and money and influence so long as nothing would jeopardize the Roman rule. And Jesus is starting to pick up a lot of news that's getting to Roman ears that might disqualify their position, their comfort, their ease, their status. The only person with uncommon behavior that we might struggle to really relate to in this story is Mary of Bethany. Why would she pour out her most valuable possession, a year's worth of money, out on Jesus' stinkiest, filthiest body part? Why in the world would she do that? And not only that, she loses herself in this act in such a way that she lets her hair down, something that would have created a gasp from anybody. It was so undignified. Only loose women at this time in this culture would let their hair down. And she is in an undignified way. Completely lost in Jesus. completely uncaring of what others might think. How paranoid are you about people knowing your commitment to Jesus? I want to remind us of the first time we are introduced to Mary of Bethany in order to maybe better understand why she would do such a radical thing. The first time we are introduced to her in the Gospels, we see her in Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42, where her sister Martha has graciously invited Jesus and his disciples into her home. And at that point, the common, ordinary expectation of the time and the culture was that the women were to be busy in the kitchen making food for the men. Guys, no amens on that one, right? However, Mary recognized Jesus was no ordinary man, and she was not going to miss out on learning from him regardless of the normal, ordinary expectations of her time and her culture. And she audaciously postured herself as a disciple of the Lord, something no woman would do at this time. And listen to me very carefully on this point. When Mary didn't treat Jesus as an ordinary, common man, she found out that Jesus wasn't going to treat her in ordinary or common ways either. Do you look at Jesus as common and ordinary? If you're honest, do you see him as king, as Lord, as the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth? If that was the case, would your actions reveal that in where you spend your time? See, we can relate to the political rallies. We can relate to losing ourselves in trying to turn a culture for our comfort and our ease and our way of life. As though they're the highest authority that hold the most power. We can make time for those things, but making time for Jesus, well, hopefully we can squeeze them in. See, she didn't look at Jesus as just an ordinary person, so she did extraordinary things to make time to be with him. And look at what Martha's reaction is in Luke 10, 40-42. It says that Martha, her sister, came to Jesus and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. She's rebuking Jesus and Mary. And listen to Jesus' response. Martha, Martha. The Lord answered. He's Lord. 
You are worried and upset about so many things. How about you today? What are you worried and upset about going on in your life? There's a lot to be upset about, isn't there? I mean, they were upset at Jesus' time on his coronation about the Roman authority. But few things Jesus said are needed. Indeed, only one thing should be the priority, the preeminent thing in your life. And Mary has chosen it, and it's not going to be taken from her. Do you know what the purpose of your life is from your Creator? It is to be with Him and learn from Him before you do anything for Him. What does your behavior say about who you think Jesus is? Is he the priority? If you're honest about the assessment of your life and where you pour your energy and your time, what you make sacrifices for, is it Facebook, Instagram, career status, cultural expectations, clean house, nice car, what others think of me? What's in the most preeminent place? You know what I know about you and me? is you always make time for what matters most. Everybody's so busy until that thing that you love comes up, and then you'll make all the sacrifices necessary to make sure that happens. My dad used to joke with me in my teenage years when I had the trouble getting out of bed. He said, I've never, I noticed you never struggle to get up for the 7 a.m. tea time with golf. See, what Mary discovered is when you take time to draw near to God, God will draw near to you, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek after him. And so not only does Jesus now become her defender and receive her as his disciple, but the next time we see her, she's at his feet again making intercession to him. See, here's the thing that I love about this story. We can't relate anymore, thankfully, because women now are equals with men as they should be. But at the time of Jesus, women were looked at as property, as less than. They weren't allowed to be educated. And here's Jesus saying, whomsoever will see me as valuable is allowed to sit with me, and I will make you my disciple, and I will pour into your life. And see, in our context, in our culture, it'd be like that person that you look at that is unworthy, that doesn't deserve Jesus, that Jesus says, no, if, if you see me as valuable, I see you as valuable. You can have a piece of me. I don't play favorites. Whomsoever will can come. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. It doesn't matter what others' expectations are. If you come to me, I will pour myself out on you. So the next scene, after, after she's sitting at Jesus' feet to learn from him, Jesus shows up to Lazarus' funeral, and Mary is at his feet again. And she's crying out because she knows who he is because she's taken the time to be with him and sit beneath him. You know what to sit at somebody's feet is? It's a humble posture. I'm here to learn from you. I'm here to make you my king. I'm not here to rule over you. It's not Jesus. Well, if it makes sense and if it's me, then I'll do it. No, it's Jesus, your God, not me. Whatever you say, not what I think. Your king, not me. I will be made in your image and likeness. I'm not going to bring you down to my level and try to make you in my image and likeness. I'm going to let you speak. And that leads her then to an experience of intercession at his feet, of of crying out, of prayer now. You know, when you come and you learn from Jesus and you see he is so good and his instruction is so right and it makes so much sense and the world would be better if they would just do what he says, now you want to pray to him. Now you want to seek his intercession because you recognize that you need a savior. You need intercession in your own life and not only in your life, but in the lives of those around you. And she says, Jesus, if only you would have been here, you could have made a difference. She's not content with things as they are because she knows who he is. You know, what gets, leads to desperate prayer is when you know who he really is, that he can actually change things, that he can resurrect dead things and bring new life to you and those around you. I'm up here today not because I'm good or worthy, but because when I called on the name of Jesus Christ, Jesus was faithful. Jesus was there, and he drew me to himself, and we've titled this, 
sermon series, Jesus the Bridegroom, because like a groom, he is seeking after people to know him as his all-sufficient Savior. He is wooing all people to himself, saying, come, I want to deliver you, I want to rescue you, I want to help you, but the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to put to death sin in your life. I'm going to rescue you from the penalty and the power of sin so that you can be a part of my kingdom forever. You can taste and see and experience. This isn't playing religion. This isn't playing church. Let's just go home if he's not alive and well and can intercede and can make a difference. What's the point? We're talking about a living God that you, anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord can intercede and bring life to death. Jesus answers prayer when we posture ourselves humbly at his feet. And you see, then she got to experience the power of God in her life, and it leads to this scene today where she's no longer paranoid about what others might think about her. She's not calculating the cost of her sacrifice to Jesus. Her only regret is that she doesn't have more to give because she knows this is God. This is her creator. This is her savior. This is her all in all. This is Jesus, the preeminent one. This is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He is my all in all. He gives me my next breath. Whatever you want, Jesus, I'm happy to pour out on you. I can't give you enough. I don't care if I got a little undignified and somebody has a problem with it. You raise my brother from the dead. Man, when Jesus begins to raise you from the death of sin in your life and he starts to make you in his image and likeness and you experience victory over things like anger and lust and fear and anxiety and he starts to, and you know that you have eternal life, you might get a little undignified too, let me tell you. When the Holy Spirit of God is residing in you, testifying to you that if you die today, it's okay to die is gain because I get Christ, man, I might go ahead and get a little radical. Excuse me. I mean, you were cheering for the NCAA. See, Mary's pouring herself out because she's been sitting at his feet and interceding at his feet and experiencing the power and the goodness of God in her life. And so <laughs> she's more than happy to worship. And she might get overwhelmed once in a while and do something radical. You see, even though she looked very ordinary on the outside, like Jesus looked very ordinary on the outside, she had the word of God coming alive on the inside so that what was going to come out of her was no longer common or ordinary, but extraordinary. You know, Christians in the New Testament, you know what they're called by the Apostle Paul? They're not called saints. In fact, I hate that translation, just so you know. They're called holy ones. Every letter Paul addresses to Christians, he calls them holy ones. I want to put on the overhead for you what that word in the Hebrew means, kadash, the Hebrew word for holy. If I could get it up there. There we go. It means, literally means to be separated from and dedicated to. To move from a common or ordinary place to being something special and set apart for a special purpose. So you've heard it said, you know, that, you know, maybe your mom or your grandma, she had china in a china cabinet, and it would never come out except for special times, maybe Easter Sunday. I know in our house we have special set-apart plates and silverware, they're going to come out at Christmas and Easter and certain holidays. That is Kadash. And you see, when, when you begin to come to Jesus and open your life to him as king of your life, when you humbly sit before him to learn from him and be instructed from him, and he now begins to become king of your life, and he deposits his Holy Spirit in you, you're not normal anymore. <laughs> You're not just like anybody else. No, you're set apart for his special purposes. You're in the king's stead now. You're not like everybody else that's just living for the lust of the flesh and on a happiness quest. Will it make me happy? Then I'm just going to do it and test it out. That leads to a hollowed soul. 
In fact, I hope that if you're on the fence, you'll just go ahead and indulge yourself until you're ready to make Jesus Lord because that's an empty road. You gotta come to the end of yourself. Come to the end of yourself. You gotta recognize that nothing is, can replace the creator God that you were made for. You were made for him and until you belong to him, you will be empty. Fleeting pleasure, just a chasing after the wind. You were made for him, and he is jealous for you. Like a groom for his spouse. And I'm telling you that if you've committed your life to him, be holy as he is holy. Be what you are. You have the Holy Spirit of God. He's made a deposit in you. He's paid a bride price for you to belong fully to him. You gotta knock it off with the stuff of this world. You're not normal anymore. Be what you were made to be by God. Knock off the porn. Knock off the anger. Knock off the fear. Get with Jesus. You have the power, the resurrection power of God in you. The grace of God is sufficient. Paul says, is grace there that we could sin more? No, God forbid grace is there to set you free, to make you different, to shine bright, to carry the name above every name well. You have victory in Jesus, not just it positionally, but in practice. And that's what we're here for, brothers and sisters in Christ, to remind each other who we are. We were called by God for God to belong to him. Knock it off with the things of this world. It will never satisfy. Those are empty vessels. The hope of this world is not another politician. It's the church of Jesus Christ showing the goodness and the power of God. Legislation can't change hearts. Jesus Christ alone can change hearts. We need to treat him as king and repent of our sin and go back fully to him. We belong to him. There's victory in Jesus. And that's when we, listen, listen, the biblical word for glory. I'm, I'm giving you some lessons in theology today. The biblical word for glory, it means weighty, significant, preeminent. When you stop treating Jesus as normal, as just another guy, when you start giving him weight and significance to make sacrifices of time and energy like you do at your work network, like you do for Netflix, like you do for your social media apps when you stop treating him as a normal dude that you hope you can squeeze into your schedule and you start giving him weight and preeminence he will give you weight and he will give you preeminence and you will start to shine like a star in the heavens and you will be a light to a dark world do you want your life to be common and ordinary like everybody else just living for the lust of the flesh or do you want to be used of god he has Resurrection power for his people, church. We gotta wake up and stop pouring ourselves out like the crowds in this story for Fox News and CNN. Yes, be involved in politics, cast a vote. That's not gonna change things. You know what's gonna change? Change you, taking Jesus seriously as king. That's what's gonna change. Don't squeeze him out of your schedule or just squeeze him in when it's convenient. Give him weight and preeminence. You know, in a sense, what Mary is doing here by pouring this out on Jesus is showing her devotion to him before it's too late. It's like giving roses while he's still alive rather than giving them at the funeral. In other words, in the same way, we only have so much time to serve the body of Christ. We only have so much time to take what God has given us, our gifts, our treasure, our money, our time, our, to pour it out on him, his body, his people. You know what his command is? If he's king, love one another as I've loved you. This is my command. Don't just receive it, give it. You want to put me in the most preeminent place? You better put my people in the most preeminent place because as you did it to the least of these, you did it unto me. Who is he talking about? Brothers and sisters in Christ. You're out there living individually. You're out there chasing the things of this world. You don't have time for the people of God. How are you going to love Jesus and pour yourself out on Jesus without having people to pour yourself out on? He gave you his spirit, his gifting for his people, and you're absent. 
Because other things are more preeminent. You got, you don't, you're making sacrifices for temporary things, not eternal things. You want your life to count for all of eternity. You got to pour yourself out for Jesus on the church, on his people. Somebody's got to tell you the truth. Mary, she doesn't care what role it plays. Uh, if it's just his feet, <laughs> nobody sees it. If it's just his feet, if I could just pour myself out on his feet, he's worth it. Jesus, whatever you want me to do, my life is yours. You're worth it. <laughs> Listen, success in life is contentment with Christ no matter what the world says is successful. I'm so filled with the fullness of Christ, so content in him that if success doesn't come the way that somebody measures success, if I've got Jesus and I'm with the people that love him and the people who hate him are against me, I'm blessed. I'm the happiest guy there is because live or die, I got Jesus and he is good and his love endures forever. And in him is fullness of joy. I've gone after the things of this world, and it is hallowing to the soul. You say, how do I, how do I treat Jesus as king of my life? I serve his children. I give back to his people. He says, as you did it to them, you're doing it to me. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Paul's like, I'm not persecuting you. Who are you? I'm just killing the church. He's like, you're doing it to me. I so identify with my people. I am them, and they and me, and we one with the Father, that as you do it to them, you're doing it to me. And as you neglect them, you're neglecting me. It's easy to sing a song, praise forever to the King of Kings. Are you willing to sacrifice for him where he's calling you to sacrifice for him? And so hear me, hear me. Whatever your hand finds to do it with all your might unto the Lord. Every day is an opportunity to serve the king. Serve the king in your house with your family. Jesus, I'm here to serve you. How can I serve my family? He says, sit at my feet and, and contemplate with me. I'll teach you through my word. Pray, intercede as Mary did. Pray for resurrection to come into your marriage and with your kids. Be with my people who can encourage you and carry you and help you understand the word where you're lacking, help you apply it where you need help applying it, strengthen you where you're feeling weak. And together will be a picture of the fullness of what it means when Jesus is king. See, people should be coming out of a tired world and visiting us and going, well, if that's what it looks like when Jesus rules, when Jesus gets his way, I want to be a part of those people because those people, man, they really love each other. I don't find that anywhere in the world. They're full of malice and hate, and they're spewing hate. They're very ordinary, very predictable. Those Christians, man, they're not ordinary or predictable in any way. They love their enemies and pray for them and serve them and bless them. Where do they get that radical idea from their king, King Jesus, who wants to make friends out of his enemies, starting with us? Hosanna is a Hebrew word that meant save, help. The palm branch is symbolic of a victorious ruler. Jesus wants to rescue us from an empty, meaningless life spent on us where I'm king and I'm Lord and I squeeze him in when, when it's convenient. I'll be my own savior, thank you very much. I'll decide for myself what's right and lead a very hallowed life like Judas who, by the way, what land of legacy do you want to leave? I don't know anybody who wants to name their son Judas. I know a lot of people happen to name their daughters Mary, though. What kind of legacy are you going to leave? One poured out in service to Jesus because you've spent time with him and it's just the overflow of your heart because his heart is one with your heart and his heart is one of love and giving himself away. Or are you just going to be ordinary like everybody else and just waste your time on temporary things of this world? that leave a hallowed soul anyways. I'm calling you to slow down, eliminate hurry, sit at the feet of Jesus, learn from him, pray to him, partner with him, and he'll bring weightiness to you and share his glory with you, and people will be amazed 
at that weight you carry in every room you go to because you're not just bringing yourself. You're bringing Jesus with you. Let's pray. Jesus, forgive us for any time that we've treated you as ordinary. That we've taken you for granted. (laughs) That we've gone into a day just going to do our own thing, call our own shots, go our own way. You're just a get out of jail card, a quick emergency button. when you died to be intimate and one with us every single day, when you died to partner with us every single day to to talk to us and walk with us, when you've given us your word that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, when you've given us gifts to be your hands and feet to each other, to pour ourselves out in service to you by serving one another, Father, would you sober us and awaken us and bring resurrection power to us, a love full to overflowing out of us that we are just exuberant to be in your service. We know it starts in the quiet place with you. And it works itself out from there. And Lord, we have gotten into some bad habits. Our souls are so hurried and so distracted. There's so much information being pumped into us. We're worried about losing our comfort, our ease. We're we're worried about the cost when the true cost is not coming to you, the lover of our souls, the one who alone can fulfill us. Jesus, would you open the eyes of our heart to see that you are so good and you are love and you are joy and you are peace and it's in you alone that we do not need to fear. God, would you help us to take advantage of the means of grace you've given us? The word of God, the body of Christ, brothers and sisters here, to walk arm in arm in the fight. Prayer and intercession. Fasting. Lord, we want to belong fully to you. We want to pour ourselves out in extravagance for you. Oh, if only we could give more. But Lord, take what little we have. And and I just pray some people would look at us and go, man, there's something so peculiar. They're so different in the best of ways. They're so kind. They're so gentle. They're so ready to serve. And if that's what Jesus is, if that's what Jesus looks like, I want to be a part of that. God, would you draw people to yourself here? Would you have mercy on us sinners? God, we can't do it, but we believe that you can. We come weak and empty-handed, and we pray you fill us full to overflowing with your love, with your joy, with your peace, with your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your promises, God, that as we draw near to you, God, you draw near to us. That as we pray and believe in the private place that you will bless us for it with your presence, with your fullness. That our hearts could finally be satisfied in a way that we don't have to fight for the things of this world anymore because we recognize they can't satisfy us anyways. And they're fleeting. Lord Jesus, bring salvation. Lord, would we believe in our hearts not only that you raised You were raised from the dead, but may we all confidently be able to say that Jesus is Lord. Be Lord of our lives today. Take up the throne. Humble us. Humble us. And help us to take the next step for the glory of your name. Amen.